Hello, everyone, and welcome to Lab Manager's Ask the Expert interactive session with our lab. My name is Mary Beth Didana, and I'll be moderating this discussion, Ductless Fume Hoods, When, Where, Why, and How. During this interactive session, we encourage you to share your questions, opinions, fears, and perceived risks on ductless fume hood technology with our speakers. Learn the facts about ductless fume hood technology, the steps taken during consultation and installation to mitigate risks, and a checklist of what you should ask when shopping for these systems. You will also see a live demonstration on how to reduce exposure risks by holistically improving the lab's air quality through various filtration solutions. Please submit your questions or comments at any point during this digital event. To ask a question or leave a comment, simply type your query into the Q&A box located on the right-hand side of your screen. We invite our LinkedIn Live viewers to submit their questions on LinkedIn Live as well. We will address as many questions as possible during our time together, but if we happen to run out of time, I will forward any unanswered questions to our FumeHood experts and they can respond to you directly if possible. I would like to remind you that the recording of this digital event will be available on demand shortly following this interactive session, so please watch for an email from Lab Manager on how to access this free video once it's available. I'd like to extend a special thank you to our sponsor, Erlab, whose support allows Lab Manager to offer these digital events free of charge to our readers. Our moderator for this interactive session is Jonathan Klain, Senior Safety Editor at Lab Manager. After 35 years in EHS working in academia, teaching, and consulting, Jonathan enjoys writing articles on risk, lab safety, and our softer power skills like storytelling, risk perceptions, persuasion, etc. As Senior Safety Editor for Lab Manager, he gets to share these and many technical areas with their readers and you. Thanks for being here, John. Maybe you'd like to say a few words? Yeah, thanks so much, Mary Beth. Hey, Jesse. Hey, Ken, and everyone out there. Thanks so much for joining us. It's a pleasure to be here and doing this. This is the sort of stuff that excites me. It, the technology has improved so much over the years, and I think it's great that we're able to uh, talk about it. I only wish I could go back in time. If I had a DeLorean with a flux capacitor, I'd go back and 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 use a lot of this technology when I was in a couple of colleges of engineering and we really could have used it. So this is really exciting and I'm very happy to be able to help. Okay, great. Thanks, John. Now I'd like to introduce our fume hood experts for this interactive session. Jesse Coro is general manager at Erlab Inc. Jesse has over 25 years of experience providing solutions to increase safety within the biopharma, pharmaceutical, medical device, and educational markets, with his specialty being focused on air filtration solutions for the protection of personnel, facilities, and the environment. Jesse's body of work includes USP 797 and 800 compliance strategies, the development of sterile preparation and processing strategies, and environmental monitoring for aseptic processing. Along with his body of work in the healthcare sector, Jesse has been an advocate for IAQ improvements, working with the IAQA and ASHRAE to help establish guidelines and acceptable indoor air quality improvements for virus mitigation while advocating for establishing IAQ standards. Ken Crooks is Director of Green Fume Hood Technology at Erlab Inc. Ken has more than 35 years of experience as a product director, director of technical services, sales and market development manager, applications engineering manager, and product manager in commercial and industrial HVAC industries. He works as director of Green Fume Hood Technology at Erlab in Raleigh, Massachusetts, which produces world-leading research-grade filtering technologies for fume hoods and laboratories. Ken is a member of multiple standards committees and organizations, previously serving as I2SL New England Chapter President and CIFA Board of Directors Vice Chair. His education includes an HVAC design certificate from Northeastern University in Boston and a BS in management from Lesley University in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Jesse and Ken, thanks for joining us. Please start us off with a few words. Thank you, Mary Beth. I'll start. So Jesse Coro, General Manager at Erlab. Thank you, everyone who attended. For those who don't know, Erlab provides exposure control solutions for the protection of laboratory personnel and has been doing so for over 50 years. Today, we're going to talk a lot about the importance of ductless fume hoods and really uncovering the misconceptions that many have regarding the technology. And of course, I will talk more about exposure risks and how do we improve the air we breathe, which is why I have many bottles of water in front of me here because they do represent a lot of significance. Um, some quick stats I'll throw out and then I'll give the floor to Ken. We breathe eight to 10 liters of air every minute. Throughout a work, working year, we breathe over 250,000 gallons of air. So none of us would realistically drink that water, let's just say air is water, if it was polluted, because we care about what we put into our body. Unfortunately with air, 
we don't have a choice. We have to breathe. It's essential. If we don't breathe, we die. And most times we don't see the actual pollution levels in a lab, in a facility, wherever it may be. So we really have to look at the risk factors associated with air and do the best we can to establish a safe solution throughout the breathing zone, again, representing the best clean environment we possibly can. And that's what we do ultimately with all of our technologies from whole room air filtration systems you see above me called the HALO. And then we have at source capture solutions, of course, with ductless fume hoods. We have our own line called Capt Air. We have exclusive partnerships with Lab Conco. And we have, of course, filtering storage solutions and integrated solutions that go on to the most noxious and hazardous chemical, uh, chemical cabinets, which are the flammable and or acid cabinets. So with that, Ken? Wow. Well, I don't think there's anything <laughs> much left to Sorry. say. No. Well done. Thank you, Mary Beth. Thank you, Jesse. It's a pleasure to be here. I get involved more on the design side. So as you said, I'm involved with many standards committees from the NCC 95 to ASHRAE TC 9.10. NFPA 45, so I serve actively on these committees and uh, help them embrace ductless technology in a safe and appropriate way. Uh, and we're seeing that across the country, actually across North America, CSA Z316.5, same there, fully embracing ductless hoods now and, and the requirements to do that safely. So I'm more on the architects and engineering side of things though, also serve this time of year out in the field, starting up the projects that I helped design eight years ago. That's always fun to see that come to conclusion. Um, so I'll give it back to you, Mary Beth, or Jonathan. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. I'll invite Jonathan to start us off with uh, yep. some of the questions we've already gotten from the audience. Yep. Absolutely. Hey guys, this was great. Love seeing the Poland Spring water. Feels like I'm back in Maine, <clears throat> which would be really nice considering I'm in Arizona. It's hot, hot, hot here. But it, this is this is a lot of fun. Um, so let's get right into it, Jesse. I think the first question I'm seeing is really maybe uh, for you. So it's a question that I think a lot of people have. How can I be sure that a ductless hood can really handle my application, the chemicals that I will be using? You know, what sort of safety guarantee or guarantees do I have? Yeah, great question. Well, first and foremost, we have to run a complete feasibility study of actual handlings that are performed within that fume hood to first determine A, is ductless filtration applicable for your specific application? And that goes into depth. It's really called what we, we call our eValley Quest process. And we have to understand the chemicals that are used, the type of handling, the frequency and the quantity. So we understand the overall evaporation modes of those chemicals. Then from there, we perform a feasibility study with our laboratory um, and they determine, again, is ductless the right solution to meet their specific chemical handling requirements? And then at that point, what is the overall longevity of the filters or the filter life cycle? On average, our filter life cycles are between 24 and 48 months. Of course, there are variables there. We do have some customers that the filters will only last six months, depending upon, again, the type of handling performed in that hood. And the reason we're able to do this is because we've established an approved chemical listing. This is critical. Without this, we cannot do a feasibility study. This chemical listing is part of the AFMOR NFX 15211 safety standard for ductless fume hoods. This is comprised of over 700 chemicals tested under six different concentrations twice. It represents thousands of chemicals. And not only do we provide you with the list of chemicals we're able to retain, but we also provide you the molecular grams of each chemical we're able to retain within that filter before we've seen release no greater than 1% of the threshold limit value. So there's a lot of detail that goes into this feasibility study to ensure the safety of our clients. That's, that's great. There's a lot of technology that goes into it. The front end, the feasibility study by your PhD chemist, all of the science that you've put into it. I know we've got a lot of space to go. So everyone in the audience, if you have any specific questions or if you didn't quite understand something that we were chatting about, please feel free to post a question. So I've got a couple of questions here. I'm gonna do them in an order that I think makes sense. The first one I think is for you, Ken. And so uh, VAV, vol uh, variable uh, air volume, right? We have a lot of jargon in this industry, so <laughs> we'll, we'll try to help everyone with the alphabet soup here. So VAV controls on ducted hoods. Don't yes. always save me airflow. So when do ductless hoods really save airflow? And then after that, I'll ask a follow-up on air changes per hour, okay? Okay, all right, fantastic. Thank you, Jonathan. That's a good question. And, and this is something that 
we approach, you know, in the industry, having been in it for many, many decades now, you know, the VAV, the ducted hoods, VAV is an energy saver when you can turn down your ducted hoods to a point that gets down to the required ventilation rate of that laboratory. Well, if you can't, if you can't, I'm saying if, you, if you're below that, if you've got one VAV hood in a large, say, pharmaceutical lab, and that one VAV hood's off in an alcove, if you go VAV on that fume hood, you're just going to open up the general exhaust because you have to maintain more air just for your normal ventilation rate. So you have to exceed the minimum ventilation rate of that laboratory. And that, as you know, Jonathan, that's set by EHS, right? What is that? The hazard level in that laboratory, the most credible spill you know, what sort of dilution factor is needed. And again, talking the laboratory air, the air we're breathing as we stand in that, that laboratory. So that's required. There are minimums published in the standards, um, certainly in the codes. And then it can always be greater than that if the risk is greater than that. Until the fume hood exhaust exceeds that level, you will not save a dime by going VAV or quite frankly, even going ductless. So you need a laboratory where the quantity of hood exhaust exceeds the ventilation rate. That's when you get into the opportunity to save money, both via VAV if you have to use ducted hoods and absolutely via ductless if you can use that technology if it's appropriate for your application. So it involves some math as most things do it seems these days, involves some math just to make sure that you're in the zone where you're going to get those energy savings. So are you saying that the algebra I took in high school is actually gonna come in handy? Is that the deal? <laughs> <laughs> It will. It absolutely has. I have a 15, now 16 year old in high school right now doing very well in math. And, awesome. and maybe, yeah, maybe I'll have to employ him to, to do some of the calculations. for. Oh, us. no, ab absolutely. I remember when my son <laughs> made the math team and that was it. I couldn't help him anymore with his math. Questions. <laughs> I know that feeling. <laughs> All right. So a good a good follow up. Brian has asked a really great question. And so I think it's it's still to you, Ken. And then uh, I've got another one after that uh, that's back to you, Jesse. So um, Brian asks, how many air changes per hour is recommended for ductless fume hoods? So I think it gets at what you were just talking about. Maybe you can flesh it out a little bit more and help Brian with his specific question. Yeah, okay. And this, this is a good one. This could go in one of two ways. So the industry is starting to look at the interior volume of a fume hood, air changes per hour inside the fume hood, right? So I'll touch on that briefly. NFPA 45, the fire protection standard for laboratories using flammable chemicals, that has a, it's not exactly a requirement. It's a statement, a, a comment, an explanation comment saying 150 to 375 hood air changes per hour, certainly not room air changes per hour, uh, <laughs> hood air changes per hour are recommended just to avoid concentration building up inside of that, either for a flammable explosive concern or corrosive concern for that matter. Uh, so when it comes to the ductless hoods, the applications tend to be, quite frankly, less aggressive. Uh, my number one, though that's not a universal, my number one application is undergraduate chemistry teaching rooms, classrooms, right, laboratories, where they can define how much is being used. And it's typically 50, 75, or 100 milliliters of something, 37% hydrochloric acid, isopropyl alcohol, so forth and so on. If you were to spill all that, you can't build up to a concentration of concern. You just can't. We've done all the calculations. There's some real math involved there, too, and you're not going to get near a problem. So for us, we're limiting the flow through the filters to make sure we get full adsorption and, and actually adsorb and retain every one of those grams Jesse just mentioned that's in our chemical uh, listing. So that's important. You can't exceed that. You can't just keep increasing the airflow to do further dilution in your hood. So all of that we look at during that risk assessment early on that Jesse was mentioning earlier. Quickly, on the room side, the room air changes, this is open to basic, well, it's not open to interpretation. The standards are actually removing set guidelines. It used to be, you know, six to 12, eight to 10, really backing away from that and saying, it's up to the owner, the responsible person, usually the EHS safety officer on that, on that customer site to determine what is the appropriate air change rate. Because just like face velocity through an open sash, there is no air change rate that is deemed safe for all applications. Right. We have to look at it from an application to application perspective. Right, and I think the specifics, uh, I, I think make total sense and hopefully resonate really well. I think a lot of us in this industry who, who work in labs and deal with chemical hygiene really understand that it's gotta be the specifics. 
it's a great segue into this next question. Uh, but a, a quick note, I loved that you said, Ken, that you know, just cranking up air more and more and more is not going to be a solution. I think that's too much of a um, uh, of a shortcut that a lot of us do, and there's problems all over the all over the place, including creating a vortex where you could end up with a fire at the top of the of a ducted hood. Right. Well, good point. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Yeah. I was talking to an expert in that field, and he was showing me some video that went horribly wrong. <laughs> Oof. That's for sure. But that's a whole nother set of set of uh, discussions. Jesse, so yes. Joe Joseph asked a really good question too, and I think he's he's um, asking relative to a couple of things. So his question is, how do I get an approved chemical listing to determine if a ductless hood is appropriate? And tell me if this is right, Jesse. It's sort of a two part. There's there's the booklet that you were showing, which I think we've we've put in the handouts. For this yes. and then yes. also maybe you can talk a little bit more on the specifics of the feasibility study that you do for every single uh, one of your customers and people who are looking to do this right yeah great question so we will start at the list of chemicals we cannot retain because as much as we know our right. capabilities right. we know we know our limitations right so we'll it's start a, there and it's a short list too it, right it's a short <laughs> list it's those chemicals that are uh, uh, Dangerous under normal pressure and temperature conditions, you know, noble gases, um, mercury, we don't recommend because we don't have a means of proper detection, but chloric acid because you have to have a proper wash down hood. So, but the list is very short. I think it's 13 chemicals. It's, right, it's, right. It's, it's ashes at standard temperature. That, that's it. And after that, it's really about quantity. What is the quantity that's going to be handled within, within the hood? Limitations are minimal. Sometimes we have to put some administrative controls in place and you have to reduce the handlings and we work with our customers. If we get a feasibility study or an eval quest, let's call it, it's a chemical questionnaire, and our first run through is we can't handle this volume. We will go back to the customer and say, listen, X, Y, and Z chemicals, you're handling way too much. The volumes are too high. Can you reduce this? Can we add a vacuum pump? Can you use an Elmire flask? There's many different things we can do to reduce the overall evaporation within that hood to allow ductless to be an applicable solution for your application. So it's really going through that process, understanding in depth the handlings that are performed. Now, handlings can change. And I know that question's probably coming up and I'm probably <laughs> getting a little ahead of myself. That's handlings right. can change within a fume hood. That's okay. We have what's called an Erlab Safety Program or ESP. We have specialists that we employ, we have three specialists on site that will constantly manage all of our customers. So if any handling is to change, they contact us, the customer, and say, hey, I'm going to add hydrochloric acid into the soil, in addition to all of the other chemicals. And I'm gonna be using 10 mLs of it five times a week. Can we rerun the validation? And when I do so, is my hood still safe? Can I use this hood for that application? On most instances, the answer is yes. We approve about 70% of the applications we, that we, we review. So we have a high approval rate. Now, some of that, again, we have to go back and we have to talk our customers through reducing loads, maybe using different types of handling techniques. But on average, it's about 70%. Now, Ken mentioned undergrad. Our, our market is academia for sure, pharma, biotech, histology, pathology, or clinical labs, um, petrochemical, flavor and fragrance. So we handle a vast variety of different applications. Yeah, that's great. All those different, all those different industries, all those different use cases. That's really fantastic. And it really is the specifics of it. So I think this is a good uh, follow up to what you just said. Anne Marie would like to know, and I think I know the answer. Have you seen? But I'll let you do it. Have you seen a large use of ductless hoods in industry? And if yes, in what capacity? So you can talk about that. And then uh, she asks, uh, can we get a copy of the chemical manual that you mentioned at the beginning? And that's, I believe, in the handouts. There's about five or six handouts that everyone should uh, feel free to download right now. But let's, I guess, just answer a question, if you would, Jesse, about industry and, and uh, usage and in what capacity. Yeah, well, the answer is yes. yes. In, in the capacity, the type of usage, um, and, and really any type of manipulation, titration, rotary evaporators, HPLCs, um, general media prep phase chemistry, really the, the only thing we steer away from is any type of high volume acid digestion. 
you do an acid digestion to that level, we stay clear of that application. Um, other than that, again, it's, it's the quantity. So yes, we've seen ductless fume hoods have an in, intake, an increase in usage. Um, we've seen growth exponentially year after year, and it's because of the paradigm shift. People are understanding that ductless fume hoods, you do not be afraid of them if it's the right hood and if the, the customer or if the, sorry, the company is establishing the right, the right feasibility studies and guarantees of safety. Um, these hoods can be used, again, for a vast majority of the, of the handlings within any lab, any industry. May I, may I add to that? Please. Yeah, yeah please. So I know, I know people love bright lines, right? And it's just easier if we say yes and no, and they're not the maybe. There, there is a realm of maybe. There's a realm of gray. And as Jesse was saying, yeah, adaptability. Sometimes it's as simple as this one chemical handling the customers declared. Could you do that instead in the ducted hood in your laboratory and then use the ductless hoods for everything else you've declared? In many cases, it's yeah. Yeah, sure, no problem. And that one thing we're asking them to move is probably something that's highly evaporative. So a big cleaning process. They've got a tub they're dipping glassware in of acetone or isopropyl alcohol, mm -hmm. and it's highly evaporative. We can handle it, but the filters won't last so long that you'll get a good economic payback. So that's really what, what's going on there. And that chemical questionnaire, that update is free for the life of the hood. We don't charge for that. We're right here lockstep with our customers. And another thing that comes back from that, quite frankly, and I'm going back one question here, is that we can adjust the sensor settings, right? So we have continuous automatic detection for chemical breakthrough of the filters. And I'm sure that's a question coming up also. It is, it and is. We, we can adjust that sensitivity based on the hazard level of the chemicals being used in that way. So staying lockstep with our customers is absolutely paramount to safety. Cool, now, yes. Uh, we will come back to uh, the sensor technology. That was, for me, one of the more fascinating uh, aspects that I had not been aware of previously. Um, but I've got a couple more questions here that are really good on um, use cases and applications. So Jean asks, unless Jean is French, in which case it's Jean, but I think it's Jean. Um, does, <laughs> that's the little bit of French I can do here. Does, <laughs> except AFNOR, AFNOR is French, right? We are yes. a French-based company. Yes. They are, yeah, the standards, right? It's like ISO. So uh, Gene's question is, does your definition of ductless hood include such things as PCR stations? So she must mean uh, she or he, polymerase uh, chain reaction stations, clean benches, which is usually more for bio, but can be for just keeping your product clean. So clean room sort of applications, uh, clean bench, which blows top down toward the user, protect the product, but not the person. What's your thought about these types of of stations and similar applications? So yes, <laughs> um, <laughs> clear lines, right? Absolutely. So if you see our product behind me, um, yeah. I can actually move this one. This is a PCR workstation. This is a ductless PCR workstation. And we have a laminar flow hood that's very similar. It's a bit higher, um, all ductless. The value behind adding ductless technology onto a PCR hood or a laminar flow hood is obviously HEPA filtration. But many people don't realize that adding carbon filtration onto these units has significant value because they don't realize that the VOCs present or maybe even acids present in that lab could compromise the integrity of the product within the laminar flow hood or within the PCR workstation. You just don't think that. We think bio burdens, we think particles, things of that nature. So HEPA filtration, obviously. But molecular filtration, having the capability to adapt that has significant value. So yes, the answer is we have all those products as well. Awesome, that's great, yeah. Um, and I love that you had it right there and could show everyone, that's perfect. I love <laughs> it was story. not scripted, I, I promise. No, no, I know. <laughs> no, this was, this was a question that was, that was submitted. This is why we're doing it live, it's great. And I love that the questions are coming in. So I apologize uh, for, I'm sure, mispronouncing this name, but Iraj, I think it is. Uh, has asked about face velocity for this for this type of hood. So uh, what type or types of face velocities and ranges and whatever you'd like to speak on on that? And I don't know if that's more for you, Ken. Or, yeah, I, I kind I'll of take it. Ahead. Sure. <laughs> you're, like, for, Ken, you're like my ventilation guy, right? There we go. For, first, let me get in my defensive posture. For, no, I'm just kidding. So, so face velocity, it really depends on, you know, the enclosure, the enclosure style. We have, as Jesse was just showing, we have small enclosures, which actually have um, 
armhole openings or restricted openings. Thank you, Jesse. Yep. And in that case, we're going to guarantee you over 100 feet per minute. It might be hard to pick up on the screen. So you can kind of, I'll, I'll trace it out right. with my, my fingers here. Right. And it's, it's a hinge sash, so you can open the sash to load and unload. But otherwise, we've got smaller openings, and that guarantees you the 100 feet per minute. And then we go all the way through different product lines up to behind me in my hand here, our partnership with Lab Conco and the filtered fume hood, where it's really going to depend on the width of that hood. I'll do the most common, which is a six foot wide hood. And we've got four fans on top of that for a total of 520 CFM, not to get too deep in the math, but you're going to run somewhere around 85 feet per minute at a 14 to 16 inch sash height. The challenge is you get to certain states, and really there's only one state, California, Good old California. which requires 100 feet per minute. And so there are uh, wing, they call them wing kits, maybe sash wing kits, not maybe the best name on earth, but they, mm -hmm. they block their, their clear plexi panels and they block either side of the sash. So not, not lowering the sash even lower because it gets to the point where you can't safely use it, but instead just blocking off some area on either side and that boosts it back up to the required 100 feet per minute. But otherwise, ductless fume hoods will run in the 65, 70 to 85 feet per minute range. And that really, I think I briefly mentioned it before, that's, that is a limitation of how fast the air can move through the carbon filters. The carbon filters have a velocity, not to be confused with sash face velocity, a filter velocity maximum 45 feet per minute. Above that, we can no longer guarantee full adsorption and retention of those molecules. So that does limit, we, our filters are only so big, we can only take up so much area on top of the hood. That limits the flow. And again, 520 CFM on a six foot hood. Those that know with five inch wide sash uh, corner posts, you know pretty quickly where you're gonna get and what it's gonna take to get to whatever face velocity is required. The great news is, because it's a complex subject, mm -hmm. the great news is the entire ceiling inside a filtered ductless fume hood is the exhaust port. This isn't trying to cram the air through a 10 or an eight inch duct collar that hopefully is positioned properly with some baffles that help direct the air and so forth. I'm already getting into my, you know, my sales movements here. This is the entire ceiling. The entire ceiling is the exhaust port. So you get, while not technically laminar flow, you get very good even flow through the open sash area and immediately out of the hood. Yeah. Point is, you contain better at lower face velocities with this style of it. You do, and I just loved your moves. I want to see them on the dance floor, though. Kenny, right? you, you, no, no, <laughs> nobody wants to see that. I shouldn't have said a thing. <laughs> no, no, it was great. No, but I think your point is really well taken. Like I said, uh, I have great conversations with you guys and then with other lab experts. And too often, I think uh, we end up looking towards face velocity as an end-all, be-all, but That's it right. really isn't. I mean, air is very turbulent uh, unless it's being controlled well, just as you're saying, there's so many factors involved. And if people can picture that it's much better for the air flow and less turbulent, if you do have a, a full area that it can travel through, as opposed to you're trying to take all of this air that's going into a ducted hood that's many feet wide and force it into an eight or 10 inch uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, yep. Diameter um, uh, piece of uh, tubing, basically, right? Duct. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. yeah. I don't know what else to call it except duct, right? Tube, pipe. All right. So another good one, and we're getting deeper and deeper, which I just really love. So Kathleen is asking, speaking of filters, which we are, what's an average life for a filter in a ductless hood, which is used in a typical research lab? So not large volumes, not all day use. And I think you spoke of, about this, Jesse, but maybe refreshing. And then, and now we're going to get into something else, which is great. And how do you know when to change a filter, which is always going to be a concern. And we're going to get deeper and deeper into filter changes and what to do with them and indications and all of that as we keep going here. Lots of questions coming in. Great. Fantastic. I'll take that. Yes, please. <laughs> so, <laughs> typical <laughs> research? Typical mm. research. Um, again, that's tough to answer because yeah. there's so many variables with the research lab. Um, there's the the unknowns that may, may enter that lab. However, as Ken mentioned earlier, you will have ducted fume hoods in that lab as a safeguard, as backup or, or redundancy of safety, where you would use that for the unknown chemicals that come in. For those experiments that you're running, you know it's very predictable. 
typically we're seeing an average of 18 to 24 months, somewhere upwards of 36 months of filter life. Again, extremely variable. So don't hold me to those numbers. We have to do a complete analysis, but that's typically what we see. Um, asking about when to change the filter. That's a fantastic question. So we ran the feasibility study like we do for all our customers. And we, as part of the AFNOR standard, it's tied to this chemical listing booklet. The fume hood must operate on three phases, three conditions, operational conditions, normal, detection, and safety. So it's normal phase, detection phase, and safety phase. Normal phases, at which point, let's just say we said the filters are going to last 24 months. That is our guarantee that as long as you're using the hood, as you explained to us, for that 24 months, there will never be release exceeding 1% of the threshold limit value at the filter's exhaust. That's at which point, at that 24 month mark, now you'll have our safety program specialist contact you to say, time to replace the filters. That's when you want to replace the filters. We do not want to extend the filters, even though we have sensors. I'm actually going to show you the sensors here. We do not want to wait. There's sensors built in in the fan module. So this is, pretend it's an Oreo cookie. We have the sandwich and we have the cream filling. Primary filter, secondary filter, fan module. The fan modules will have the sensor built in. Asked the primary, not the secondary. The secondary is already done in C-level. Um, that's important. I'm going to talk about that in a moment. If we detect breakthrough past this primer, that's at which point we're in detection phase. Detection phase states that we've detected a spike in concentration. Typically, it levels no greater than 50% of the TLV. It's variable depending upon the specific chemical we're looking to detect, and we will code the sensor that's determined based on the analysis of the first prominent breakthrough sensor. It's a millivolt setting. So as the potential is modified, that sensor is going to go off. But what that means is we now have less residency sites. So there's less parking spots for a vehicle to find a parking spot, like at the mall during Christmas time. You're going to have people on curbs, on mounds, on, on snow banks. Kind of, where are they going to go? Well, eventually, they're going to get towed or whatever. Same with the molecule. The molecule is going to find a space. It's going to break through. But because we've had breakthrough, we're detecting, but we have that primary level. That, primary, uh, that secondary level is now picking up any of that breakthrough past that primary, still guaranteeing at detection phase, there's never released greater than that 1% of TLP. We don't want the hood to get into detection phase. That's the safeguard that's developed from suspenders because now what's happening is you're using up residency sites within the secondary filter because when you change the filters, this primary gets disposed, the secondary rotates down to become the primary, the new filter becomes the secondary. So now, if you used up residency sites within that secondary filter, which is now the primary, you may have less life cycle left in that filter. We don't want that to happen. So that's detection thing. So change the filters based on our recommendation. But now I'm going to talk about safety phase. What is safety phase? Safety phase means that we've detected continuous breakthrough. Now, what will happen with molecules is they'll break through, we'll see a blip in the radar, a spike in concentration, and more often than not, it remediates itself. Fine. When that sensor goes off constantly, that means now there's definitely less residency sites. We're seeing continuous breakthrough. This backup filter is now becoming used as really primary. And now you've had a spill in the hood. This is at which point we consider the hood to be in safety phase. At that point, we still have to guarantee that even at safety phase, you will not see release greater than 50% of the threshold limit value of the cumulative chemicals with used within that fuel hood for one twelfth of the filter life cycle. So in this instance, for two additional months. We don't ever want a hood to get here. If you're in safety phase, you have to address some of your administrative controls that you have in place and maybe um, talk with the h &S officer, which very likely may be those that are on the call. Say, we cannot allow this. We have just, uh, the sensing technology, the communication technology, the light on all of our products is an indicator that something within the performance criteria has been compromised. Filtration efficiency, face velocity, or mechanical aspects of the fan. That's going to pulse, followed by an audible. And then you can get into what's known as our eGuard web based program, where you can actually see what the potential failure or safety breach is within that field. So there's many different indicators there, so that hood will never get into safety phase. That's part of our what's known as smart technology. Now, smart technology has a lot of benefits what I just mentioned there. But it also can allow you to help improve laboratory practices, especially with those using a few more. What do I mean by that? Well, you notice every day at three o'clock, 
Your hood's alarm. It's in, it's in face velocity alarm. Joe's using the hood. Like this. Oh, okay, oh. that's Sasha's hood. We, we've, all seen, we've all seen it. Oh, Joe, yeah. listen. I've noticed that I've had an alarm every day at 3 o'clock. We know you're using that hood. Understand the importance of this sash and contain it. You open that sash to higher levels than where it's, it's certified. We cannot guarantee containment. When we can't guarantee containment, safety is compromised. So there's a lot of benefits behind that smart technology. And that's built into all of our products, from the halo to the hoods to the storage to that what's known as the chem track system on top of that flammable cabinet. Sorry for blocking it underneath that Erlab logo. So hopefully that answered the question. Son, that was sorry, that was very long-winded, but it, it's important. <laughs> Not long-winded, very well detailed. I loved it. Lots of lots of great stuff there. Of course, the redundancies are wonderful. You know, all of us in health and safety always want to see redundancies to take care of the what ifs. And a lot of us know the Swiss cheese model of risk and hazards getting through. So having redundancies like this is just fantastic. The other I just wanted to quickly mention. Uh, we use a lot of jargon. A lot of us know it, but not not everyone. It's the curse of knowledge. So a TLV, for those that perhaps aren't like you guys or like me, an industrial hygienist, is threshold limit value. Those are the those are the exposure limits set. Another another acronym, ACGIH. It's basically a nonprofit that's not tied to public policy, and so their limits are much more protective than the OSHA permissible exposure limits. There are limits that we like to use, not that we're stuck with from a legal standpoint. So that's great. The last thing to just make sure it's really emphasized, because I would have loved this, you know, in safety and health, we're, we're always wanting to know what's going on in the lab and we can't be everywhere. So to have something like this, where we're going to get notifications where there's some sort of, uh, some sort of issue going, going on, like you're talking about, Jesse, that's just such a, a wonderful added, you know, value add and benefit to it. I just wanted to draw everyone's attention to that. All right. Well, speaking of the filters and and all, Anne Marie would like to know what about safety associated with filter change out and what about filter disposal. And I know we've talked a lot about this. Some more acronyms coming at folks like RICRA, which is for hazardous waste and all of that. But we'll be sure to make sure everyone understands what we're talking about. But Ken, I think this is to you, bud. Sure. Thanks. And this is a very good question. And obviously you want to think whole life, full life cycle on the filter. So yes, they do need to be disposed of at the end of life. And, and that rotation that Jesse was talking about, you have to take the primary filter out. You want your PPE on at that time. You want your gloves, your glasses, your lab coat. You do not need a respirator. It's not at that level. These molecules are adsorbed. They're held in the carbon at that point. You put that used filter in the heavy poly bag that the new filter shipped in seal that up with duct tape or a tape and then you put that heavy poly bag up oh, thank you Justin. you put that filter that's now sealed in the heavy poly bag into the carbon box that the new filter shipped in and then at that point in time you no longer need ppe to handle uh, the used filters we have customers that are now doing the t-clip the toxicity characteristic leaching procedure from the epa so actually they're not doing it they hire a local analytical lab right. i'll use uh, Butler University, one of our great ecosystem customers out in Indianapolis, they hired a local analytical lab, ironically had our filtered fume hoods in their laboratory to do the testing. They oh. grabbed some of the used filters. These are, in this case, these are chemistry undergraduate teaching laboratories. So all the filters are all used with exactly the same chemicals, maybe different quantities. There's always that one hood that students don't like, that one that they really like, maybe it's close to the door so they can get out of class quickly. Anyhow, they, they take one of those used filters, which does represent every filter in that laboratory. They run the water through it. They collect all that water. That's part of the leaching process. They then sense, the analytical lab then senses that water for semi-VOCs and VOCs, volatile organic compounds. Sorry. Thank you, Jonathan. You're a good example. Yeah. <laughs> of, uh, explaining my TLAs, my, my three-letter acronyms. When none is detected, then that's, that's a certificate you need. You're good to go. That filter, those used filters that were all used that same way, they can now be disposed of in the normal waste stream. We certainly want them going to an incinerator. There is about 73 kilowatts of energy in each one of these. This is 30 pounds new, so about 35 pounds used. There is a tremendous amount of energy in that carbon, which started out as coconut shells, right? So adsorbing CO2 from the atmosphere, then was activated with heat and steam to become that activated carbon. 
it now gives off tremendous energy back to the incinerator plant. We put that energy back up on the grid. And that to me is the full life cycle and the right way to, to handle yeah. these, these filters. Excellent. If, if you can't do a T-clip or if you fail the T-clip, it is then considered hazardous material and it does have to go out for high temp incineration. Uh, I haven't personally seen that happen a lot. It, it, every time a T-clip's been done, it's passed and that's fantastic. I know you you delved into this quite a bit too, Joseph. Yeah, we delved into it with Triumvirate and Veolia where they took multiple filters that we had here from customer sites and they ran various tests, various filter tests and not one failed T-clip testing. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. yeah, and I've done a lot of environmental work, and I'm not surprised that the T clips are passing. If you, you really have to understand what that analysis is like, this is great. <clears throat> Just looking at the question queue, we've got about seven or so, so I'm going to try to be quicker about this. They're all fantastic questions. So Roma asks, and I think this is an easy one: when the filters are changed, do you need to recalibrate to the required face velocity, or perhaps do any other checks? Uh, I'll take this one. <laughs> it's different wow. for each product. Yeah, yeah. That, <laughs> very. Thank you for saying that. Yeah. So I'll speak for the ductless hoods. Uh, carbon filters do not change in pressure drop as they adsorb because they're adsorbing into the mole that the, the absorption sites inside the carbon granule. So while it's a surface phenomena, it does not increase the surface area. It's filling holes, if you will, but mm -hmm. the overall pressure drop stays exactly the same between a used and a fresh brand new carbon filter. As I alluded to earlier, really one of the only ways you can tell when you take them off the hood is by weight. They weigh more after they've been used and absorbed those thousands of grams. But HEPA filters, of course, they do change and yeah. you need to change those, but you were gonna have to say about the other products? No, so no? You, you, okay. you hit it. Yeah, as far as ductless hoods, it's yeah, none, none of the none of the products when filters are changed, regardless of what it is, does they yeah, not. a carbon a carbon with a residency sites is always going to be a very very different chemical process than yes. just straight particle uh, impact on uh, like HEPA filters or something like that. That's great. Anne Marie has a has a good one. I think this is also fairly straightforward. Can the cabinet be used as a balance enclosure for analytical purposes? Uh, absolutely. I actually have a balance in, in, in here. So yep. for sure. So they're designed because of the even distribution airflow pattern above the vertical flow of air and the whole sailing being the filter essentially. They're designed to also be powder enclosures. We can weigh down to 10 mm -hmm. to the sixth. Uh, very efficiently and effectively and we have case stories and white papers written in in partnership with Haas um, so yeah absolutely nice great Iraj has a good follow-up to earlier ones do you have any dilution ventilation so general ventilation requirements in the lab when you use a ductless uh, fume hood and I think it relates to amber so I'm going to try to merge these two and it's probably going to you can Amber's yep. question, you keep mentioning the ducted hood as a backup. Does a lab using ductless hood also need a ducted hood? And I'm trying to emphasize my pronunciations because they're so close, right? Yes, right. Okay, so the ventilation requirements in the lab are no different than they are whether you're going 100% ducted, 100% ductless, you still need that ventilation air. And that, right. should still, that should still be sized and designed based on the worst you know, scenario in that laboratory, the specific risk assessment of that laboratory um, does not change. And Great. then, I'm, I'm sorry, the follow-up question was? Yeah, sure. Amber was asking, uh, you know, we've mentioned uh, um, the ducted hood as a backup. Sometimes we've talked about that uh, uh, okay. in different, um, uh, like an emergency use case or something like that. So the Amber's question is, so does a lab that is using ductless hoods also need to have a ducted hood? Not necessarily, right? So I, I always look at things just from that airflow perspective and the dollars and cents perspective, more from a new construction or a major renovation perspective. You're going to move that ventilation air we were just talking, whether it's six air changes, eight air changes, whatever is appropriate. You might as well send that up a ducted hood until you achieve that threshold of which duct, more ducted hoods would just impact, make bigger mechanical systems, more operating costs, more capital expenditure to build the lab to begin with. That's where the ductless or DAV, if you can't go ductless, start to make sense. Right. We have been involved in many, many facilities where it's actually 100% ductless oh, yes. because the renovation expenditure to take a building 
that while it has ventilation air and it's 100% outside air ventilation air, but then to add ducted hoods would require a whole new exhaust stack, a new exhaust fan. There was no, you know, in many cases, not all, no room on the roof. There was no structural integrity to put the exhaust fan up there. No place to put a new makeup air, air handling unit, as it's called. Maybe more chiller capacity, more boiler capacity. They are tapped out, as we say, on the yeah. HVAC, um, HVAC, heating, ventilation, air conditioning system, mechanical, electrical, plumbing systems in that building. And that's where it just makes sense to go ductless. You do not absolutely need a ducted hood to accompany your ductless hood. If we've approved that application, and as Jesse said earlier, you're using that hood as you told us you're going to use it, and you're telling us anytime you make change, change is absolutely a constant. Then we're staying lockstep and you're perfectly safe. You don't have to have the ducted hood in that laboratory. Great. Can I add to, that? Oh, can I add to that? To yeah, that question? Go. Um, uh, you know, we have a lot of customers that are at capacity. They can't add mm -hmm. any more air changes, but they feel as though my lab's still not clean. I need to dilute this somehow. Mm -hmm. The halo is that. Mm -hmm. So that halo provides what's known as EACH, equivalent air change rates. One halo will effectively scrub and clean. 700 cubic volumes of air and provide you one additional air, one additional EACH. So if you need additional air changes, you need additional dilution, this is not just going to dilute, it's going to provide filtration. So it's actually purifying. It's better than dilution in some instances. You still have to have your fresh air, your outside air for sure. You have to be as per ASH rate 62.1, right? You have to be for code right. and standard right. and recommendations, right. but you need more dilution and you need more purity in that lab, that halo is certainly going to provide that for you. Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. In a very, very limited way, I can relate it to early on in my uh, industrial hygiene career doing asbestos abatement. We couldn't duct out any more of the uh, air coming into the space, but we could install more HEPA air uh, filtration to continuously circulate the air and keep it much cleaner. So it's a, it's a similar thing. Brittany has a, a very specific use case. If you can answer it, great. And if not, it's a great opportunity for Brittany to contact you all and say, hey, what about this use case, right? And so Brittany's question is steering into manufacturing and industrial side of things. We do a preparation of methyl esters of fatty acids and not in a good place to put in a full fume hood. <clears throat> Knowing nothing about ductless fume hoods, can, which is fine, that's totally fine, Brittany, right? No prereqs required here. Can these be used in place of the permanent hoods? We only run the testing once a week and use a small volume each time. So a really specific question, what do you think? Sure, um, easy answer is absolutely uh, not a problem. It's an application we've done several times. Um, the long answer is please contact us. We'll work with you to fill out that chemical analysis to provide you with that true uh, level of efficiency at the filters, but absolutely that will not be a problem. Excellent. Great. Um, way to hit it out of the park. <laughs> um, Audrey asks a good question, and uh, I think this is perhaps for both of you, but maybe back to you, Ken, on the, on the waste side of filters. Can an end user change the filters or does it require a technician? Do the used filters need to be disposed of as a chemical waste? And, and both of these you started to get at, but maybe a quick refresh and deeper into, can just an end user do this? Sure. A absolutely. So we, we offer, we just shot in this very room earlier this year, seven different maintenance service videos. So there's absolute training. We do it over the phone support 20, well, 24 seven, but 365, you'll get phone support. 410, 24 seven. Uh, yes. <laughs> and, but we are, no, seriously, we are here to support you in that. We can train you. We've got the materials to support that. We do a lot. Well, with every installation I go on, we do user training and maintenance team training at the same time as part of the handover of that project. We recognize four years from now when it's time to change that filter, you may have forgotten some of the things Ken taught you. Mm -hmm. I understand, I don't take it personally. So that's why we've got the documentation, we've got the people, we've got the phone support. You don't have to hire a professional either from your area or from us if you're in the greater New England, New York, mid-Atlantic area, we can offer you a service contract, but you don't have to do it. You can do it yourself. It's six foot ladder, 30 pounds at arm's length. That's that's what we're dealing with here. So very easy to do. Oh, and by the way, inside an air-conditioned laboratory. Uh, not on the roof. Not right. on the roof. In <laughs> Feb on Good you know, point. You know, yeah. yeah, February Excellent. or August, where you're from. And yeah. then 
and then, yeah, just a quick recap on the used filters. There's multiple avenues for disposal, whether it's true hazmat, high temp incineration, or do a T-clip on those and then out with the normal waste stream. But please, either way, make sure they go to an incinerator. We get some of that energy back up on our grid. Yeah, you know, the next time you guys are filming a whole bunch, if it's summertime where it's beautiful there in New England and I'm dying of the heat here, feel free to give me a call. I'd be happy to come and help out with that. That's for sure. All Fantastic. Right. <laughs> All right, Tom asks a good question. Is there, and I know this is to you, Ken, is there a way to put a cost on all of the condition air that is sent to the outside from a ducted fume hood? I am trying to complete a cost analysis to switch from ducted to ductless, which as you guys know very, very well, all of us in EHS and doing uh, facilities related things in labs, we often have to demonstrate the numbers to uh, someone above us, right? Absolutely, absolutely. So in the industry, we like to look at dollars per CFM, cubic feet of air per minute, dollars mm -hmm. per CFM per year. And you'll see that on the exhaust side to run your exhaust fans, the static pressure, the three phase motor, all that stuff through all the duct work. Again, speaking just ducted hoods right now, ducted. Yeah. You're looking at two to three dollars per CFM per year. So if you've got a hood, a ducted hood, eh, it's VAV. So it's average annual exhaust is 400 CFM, 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, right? Times 400 CFM times that $3 per CFM. That's your exhaust. Okay, $1,200. Well, you just bought a filter, by the way, and then some. That is not the real cost of running a ducted hood. It's serving the ducted hood. It's the makeup air cost. That range is anywhere from about $5 per CFM in the middle United States, where for whatever reason, electricity is pretty <laughs> darn cheap. I wish I had the world's okay. longest extension cord for okay. my house. <laughs> to here on here on the coast, whether the east coast or west coast, it can be eight, eight and a half dollars or higher. My electricity rate just went up yet again. I'm mm -hmm. so happy. Um, mm -hmm. Anyway, it's not about mm -hmm. me. So mm -hmm. when you look at this and you say it's eight dollars per CFM for the makeup air, the air that has to be redelivered to that space to make up the air that's been exhausted. Eight plus three, eleven dollars times four hundred. Now you're talking over four thousand dollars a year to run that ducted hood. That far, far exceeds the cost, more than double the cost, more than four times the cost of a ductless hood. And let me add to that is the CO2 emissions generated yeah. from a ducted hood. That many people look at cost, what's gonna, how is it gonna hit my bottom line? But we have to look at the fact at, at how ducted hoods impact the environment because we have to be very cognizant of that. An average six foot hood consumes 22,000 pounds of CO2 emissions a year average. Of course, that's very, very depending on how that hood's used. But we have to look at everything. It can't just be about how does it hit my the bottom line in my pocket. What are we doing for the environment? The overall good for, for us as humans, because right now it's not looking so hot. Um, so we got to do our part. And that's a big part of why we do what we do. Great. Great. I've got a couple more questions. So this might, the timing might work out just right on this and we'll be able to close out perhaps with some final words of stuff that we haven't yet covered. So Kathleen asks a good follow-up. So let's say you have a, a, a much smaller room, less than 150 square feet. How much does a ductless hood affect the room temperature or is that controlled mostly by the room air change rate? And then she asks a related one, a ductless fume hood is just pulling room air in and putting it back uh, out again, so doesn't uh, so it doesn't affect room pressure if the room is set to be negative to an adjacent room. So, sort of a couple of related questions: yep. How does it operate, and how much of a change, if any, does it have to both temp room temperature and room pressure? Yep, excellent questions, and that's the way to think it through too. Thank you, Kathleen. The largest hood you see behind us here with the four fans on it, the four stacks, six feet wide, that's drawing around 2.2 amps of 115 volt power. So we're talking less than a 726 watts, I think it is. It's not a lot of energy. Would it keep a non-ventilated enclosure if it was tightly sealed? Sure, right? You, that they like having a little 746 watt air heater underneath your desk warming yeah. your toes in the winter. Yeah. But in a ventilated laboratory, 746 watts are basically yeah. lost in the calculate the rounding error of the HVAC system. Nonetheless, air conditioning folks, when we're designing new, they do take that into effect. I've had plenty of the, the best MEP engineers across this great country asking me, what's the heat load from your hood? It's really not 
I mean, it's the 746 watts, but it's not that that's a matter. It's are you doing anything inside the hood that's highly exothermic? If you mm-hmm. are, understand that heat would be released back to the room. It's rare. It's not common. Usually those applications, quite frankly, aren't approved. But if you are heating something up, a crucible or whatnot, understand that that heat will go back into the laboratory. And thus, obviously, that heat needs to be mitigated with the air conditioning system of the ventilation air. And spot on regarding the uh, I love this part. Absolutely love this part regarding the pressurization of the laboratories and how quickly do I need to change airflow? So I'm always negative with respect to surrounding spaces, which is your typical chemistry lab. Uh, because the hood's the primary containment zone, the lab is the secondary containment zone. Ductless hoods, filtered fume hoods, as I like to call them, they are fully decoupled from any of the building management system, any of the airflow in there. They will not impact the pressurization, nor the makeup air demand, nor the exhaust demand. Open and close the sash doesn't change a thing. It just sits there and recirculates that same room air, unaffecting the rest of the building, which is just absolutely fantastic. Yeah, great. That's uh, what I assumed it to be, but I'm so glad to hear it from you, Ken. All right. So Anne-Marie uh, asks a good follow-up as well. This one's, I think, to you, Jesse. It's about the halos. And Anne-Marie is just, just curious, do the halos filter particulates too? For sure. So we have the ability to add HEPA filtration, H14, or carbon filtration, depending upon what we're looking to filter. So as you can imagine, you know, we're living in this quote unquote post COVID world. We have been instrumental in getting people back to work or students back to the classrooms because we've integrated the halo with HEPA filtration for viral mitigation. But it serves for a greater purpose than that. Um, Regard to mold mitigation, bacteria, fungus, general PM 2.5. So absolutely, it can handle HEPA filtration or carbon filtration and soon to be a combination of both. Um, With the upcoming HALO, we'll have the ability to monitor particles. We'll have the ability to monitor CO2 in addition to monitoring VOC, temperature, and humidity. So we're just continuing to add value to what this unbelievable product can do. Fantastic. And, you know, um, it looks like the questions and uh, your answers and my little bit of commentary have actually worked out very, very well. That was the last of the uh, questions being submitted by our audience. There's always plenty more for us to talk about, but that's gonna have to wait till next time, guys. I'm gonna throw it back to Mary Beth to close us out. I'll just say, Jesse, Ken, and everyone there at Erlab, it is always a pleasure. I always learn so much. Thank you so much for uh, involving me in this. And uh, I'm looking forward to the next time. And I hope you get a lot of people calling you and asking about their very specific use cases. Us as well. Thank Thank you, John. Thank you, Jonathan. Real pleasure. Okay, great. Thanks very much, Jonathan Klein, for moderating. And thank you to Jesse Coro and Ken Crooks from Erlab for this interactive session. Um, They very helpfully provided their contact info. I'm going to put it on the screen in front of you. So I encourage you to take your screenshot or when we make this video available, you can view it again. But if you would like to reach out to them offline, uh, you can certainly do so. So this does bring us to the end of today's interactive session. And again, just a reminder that the recording of this event will be available on demand shortly following this live presentation. Please watch your email for a message from Lab Manager once this video is available. On behalf of Lab Manager, I'd like to thank Jesse Coro and Ken Crooks of Erlab for taking our audience's questions and Lab Manager Senior Safety Editor Jonathan Klein for being our moderator. And I'd like to thank all of you for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us today. Once again, thank you to our sponsor, Erlab, whose support allows us to offer these digital events free of charge to our readers. For more information on all of our upcoming on-demand digital events or to learn more about the latest tools and technologies for the laboratory, please visit our website at labmanager.com. We hope you can join us again. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you, Mary Beth. Thank you, everyone.